Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Hey Nick, how you doing? I'm not doing too bad. How are you doing? I'm good. We got a we got a doozy today. Yeah, more so than usual. I know. I know. It's 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 I'm embracing myself for the intensity of this discussion. Um yeah, we we've, we've accumulated I don't know, almost an endless supply of questions on heart disease in one format or another, you know, the the specifics around lipids, um, you know, atherosclerosis in in general, these things like that. And so you know, as is often the case, I think we, we've accumulated a critical mass of questions that we can now kind of organize them into a coherent um, and thoughtful discussion around all things related to atherosclerosis. So um, I know you've done an, uh, an amazing job kind of t- taking these questions and organizing them in a way that makes for hopefully a logical discussion. So let's let's take it away. Yeah, that's the hope, right, is the hope is you know, a lot of this stuff we're going to talk about today, we could dive in so deep, like so many of these questions could be their own AMA. But what we thought as a team was, it'd be just much better to touch on all these aspects. So people who listen top to bottom can just get a really good understanding of what this is, why they should care about it, how they should think about it. And so on that note, what we thought would be important is just answering the first question, which is why should someone care about this? right? It's such a complex topic that why is it important for people to put the time in to really think through and understand it? Yeah. I mean, I think it really starts with kind of the ubiquity of this disease and its assault on human longevity. Uh, People have probably heard me say this before, but atherosclerosis is really the only inevitable disease of our species. Uh, Cancer, while prevalent with aging and dementia, while prevalent with aging, do not appear inevitable the way atherosclerosis does. So, you know, not everybody dies from atherosclerosis, but I think (laughs) to my knowledge, everybody dies with it, uh, you know, assuming they live long enough. So, um, you, you have a condition that, uh, as I said, is inevitable, is ubiquitous. Um, and also I think based on what you're going to hear me talk about today, we know a lot about this condition and we really have tools to mitigate it. And so to me, that's the reason you wanna really understand this is um, it's the impact is huge and the uh, tools that we have are also huge. So, um, you know, again, we talk about longevity. Longevity has two parts, health span, lifespan. The lifespan part comes down to delaying the onset of chronic disease of which this is the most common chronic disease. So you can sort of think of a couple of different paths to get there, but really the two biggest risk factors, uh, and I'm putting smoking aside for a moment, which is a, a very straightforward behavioral risk factor, uh, but, but sort of in, in terms of less clear behavioral risk factors, the two biggest are, are clearly hypertension, high blood pressure, and lipid abnormalities. And that's the one we're going to focus on here. So. Um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, we'll just abbreviate ASCVD for short, is really what we're here to talk about. Yeah. So as we get started on this topic, Peter, I think, you know, we have people who listen to this podcast of all ages, young, old, everywhere in between. And I think it's a common thought for people under 30, 40, even some people under 50, where they're just like, you know, this is something that only affects old people. Um, I'm, I'll think about this when I'm older, but right now it doesn't really affect me. And so how would you answer the question in its basic form of, isn't this just a disease of old age? Um, and why should those people who kind of think that not just shut off the podcast at this point and instead continue to listen and continue to put in the effort? Yeah, I, 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 I probably have told this story, um, before, and if not, uh, where if folks haven't heard it, I think it's worth hearing again, right? I remember in sort of my first year pathology lecture in medical school, the pathologist said, um, <clears throat> what's the most common presentation for a first heart attack? You know, so if a person is having their first heart attack, what is the most common thing that they will present with? That's the terminology we use in medicine. And of course the hands shot up, chest pain being the obvious. Uh, nope, that's not it. Uh, uh, nausea. Nope, that's not it. Uh, left, you know, arm pain. No, that's not it. Um, and it was a trick question. Of course, the answer was sudden death, right? The answer was 
that over 50% of people's first heart attack is fatal. Now, the good news is today that number is a little bit less. It's probably slightly below 50%, but that's still a staggering number. Now, another way to think about this is through the lens of understanding the age distribution of people who have their first major adverse cardiac event. So that is a heart attack, stroke, or sudden death due to one of those. And uh, if, if you don't mind, Nick, pull up figure one. So this, this graph shows the age distribution for both male and female in the United States uh, in terms of these incidents. I think the, the easiest graph for me to look at here is the one on the right, total annual events. And what you can focus on is the first two bars. That is the bars that are for people up to the age of 65. So if you look at the male bars, which are the darker bars, you can see that the sum total of those two bars, slightly below 25%, slightly above 25%, the implication of that is over 50% of men who are going to have a cardiac event in their life will have, have it before the age of 65. And for women, you do the same exercise. <clears throat> you can see that it's one third of women. So it's clear that there's a shift in time and that women, while subject to the exact same burden of disease, seem to experience it about a decade later. Um, still fully one third of women are going to have their first cardiac event, which is going to be heart attack, stroke, or death as a result of those things before the age of 65. And a little over 50% of men will be in that camp. So um, as we're going to talk about in this episode, that's not the whole story. It's even more compelling to care about this when you're young, when you understand how long it takes for this disease to take hold and the implications therefore for prevention. Yeah, I think the most sobering thing for me when you look at this is the, it's not even the 50% under 65. It's almost the, especially for males, the almost 25% under 54. Yeah. And especially when we get to what we get to later, which is, you know, for that to happen to someone who's 45, 50, it doesn't mean it started two years earlier. Right. And so I think it's pretty crazy when you see these type of stats laid out, kind of how it creates that shift in your mind around, you know, why you should care about this. And so I think what we need to do is first almost step back and look at what exactly is ASCVD, right? I think people have to understand what it is to then really understand how it comes about, how to think about prevention. So what do you think the best way to kind of walk people through in a relatively simple form what this disease is? Yeah, so I, I, I'll explain it at a high level now, and then I think we should go through it in some detail in a moment. But but the the the, the precy on this would be that ASCVD is a, a disease state characterized by the deposition or the buildup of cholesterol, more clearly or more rigorously sterols, which include cholesterol uh, and phytosterol in the artery wall. So it initially starts as something called a fatty streak, which I'll explain in a little bit more detail later. And then it later consolidates into things called plaques. And these can ultimately lead to a reduction in blood flow. And um, of course, it's this reduction in blood flow that leads to what's called ischemia. Ischemia is the uh, reduction in blood flow and therefore the resulting uh, tissue damage that occurs to the heart is what results in a heart attack, which can be fatal depending on the amount of the cardiac tissue that is um, impeded from appropriate amount of oxygenation. So to have this disease, you don't have to be obese. You don't have to have high blood pressure um, or things of that nature. It's really a question of the cholesterol in your blood. That's really what defines the disease. So the essential condition of atherosclerosis is the presence of cholesterol in the artery wall, which by the way, is not necessarily related to the measurement of cholesterol in the, in circulation, which we will talk about in great length. And although these often coexist, right, patients with cholesterol in their arteries do not necessarily have to have co-aggravating factors such as high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, family history, you know, smoking, all these things that exacerbate it. 
You mentioned cholesterol a few times, and obviously it's a topic that's been talked about on more podcasts than I can even count or recall right now. But for this conversation, can you define cholesterol just in its simplest form so everyone's aware of exactly what we're talking about as we're going to get into kind of the more nitty gritty? Yeah, cholesterol is an organic molecule that you know resides in the lipid family. So we typically characterize these molecules by their solubility in water. And this is a not soluble in water molecule. So it is a hydrophobic molecule. Um, and I think the easiest way to sort of picture those things is to think about oils. Uh, so if you took an oil like olive oil and you poured some of it into a cup of water, you would immediately see what it means to have a hydrophobic substance in contact with something which is the ultimate hydrophilic substance, water, right? So they would re it, they repel each other. Now, of course, cholesterol is about one of the most important molecules in the body. Um, to be clear, if we didn't have the ability to make cholesterol, we would cease to exist. We wouldn't, in fact, you, you couldn't be born without the ability to do this. There are rare genetic conditions that impair the ability to make cholesterol, and these are uniformly fatal. So why do we need cholesterol? There are broadly two things that cholesterol is essential for. The first is that they contribute heavily to the cell membrane of virtually every cell in the body. So cells are actually kind of fluid things, spherical things, and what allows them to have that fluidity and what allows them to have uh, membrane channels that allow things in and out of them is the cholesterol layer that forms the membrane. And secondly, Cholesterol is an essential substrate for the production of some of the most important hormones in the body, cortisol, estrogen, testosterone. It's also essential for the creation of bile acids, which are necessary to be able to digest food. So, you know, the, the mantra that I like to say is no cholesterol, no life. For sure. You should put that on a bumper sticker on your car. Just roll <laughs> around Texas with that guy. <laughs> no, I think that's great. And so I think the next section we're going to go through which has the potential to be a little deeper kind of than a lot of what this conversation is, which is how this all comes about. And luckily, and a quick shout out to Tom Dayspring, who created a bunch of images that we're gonna look at. Um, this kind of allows us to dive into this. And so for people who are listening to this, um, if you can watch a video, it's probably gonna be really helpful, but otherwise the show notes will also have all these images. But Kind of why don't we look at and discuss, Peter, you know, how does AS or yeah, how does AS CBD come about? Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a member. We created the membership program to bring you more in-depth exclusive content without relying on paid ads. Membership benefits are many, and beyond the complete episodes of the AMA each month, they include the following. Ridiculously comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing we discuss on each episode of The Drive. Access to our private podcast feed. The Qualies, which are a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, released every Tuesday through Friday, which highlight the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is particularly important for those of you who haven't heard all of the back episodes. It becomes a great way to go back and filter and decide which ones you want to listen to in detail. Really steep discount codes for products I use and believe in, but for which I don't get paid to endorse and benefits that we continue to add over time. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Lastly, if you're already a member, but you're hearing this, it means you haven't downloaded our member-only podcast feed where you can get the full access to the AMA and you don't have to listen to this. You can download that at peteratiamd.com forward slash members. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID Peter Atia MD. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. 
The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.